I'm not a person to ask a question to unless you want an honest answer. Like sometimes people ask questions, but they don't really want an honest answer. For instance, how's my new haircut? Or if you ever go clothes shopping, how does this make me look? There's, gentlemen, there's only one way to answer that question. And that is sometimes true and sometimes maybe not so much. I'm just, I'm not wired to, to be the guy to answer a question in the way that people necessarily want to hear. I'm just going to be very brutally honest. And so my phone rang and I answered and she was a friend of mine and, and we'd had a long friendship. And she said, hey, I, I want to ask you a question. What do you think about this guy? I'm like, he's, he's great. She's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start dating him. What do you think about that? And I said, that's a terrible idea. And shockingly, this was not the news that she wanted to hear. <laughs> and she got defensive. She's like, what do you mean that's a terrible idea? Why is that a terrible idea? I said, well, he's great and you're great, but together you're going to be a disaster. You're, you guys are not wired to, to be good together. It's just not going to end well. And I'm, do whatever you want. It's your life. But you asked what I think, and I'm telling you what I think. I think this is a terrible idea, and it's not going to go well. We never talked again after that. <laughs> well, that's all right. They dated for six months. And then it ended. And it ended bad. And it ended ugly. I mean, it was a bad, bad breakup. And sometimes two really good people who are, who, who are really kind, really sweet, really caring, really sweet people. Sometimes they can get into a relationship and things just don't work. And that's okay. That's what the dating process is meant to be. It's meant to, meant to discover that. It's meant to, meant to really discover who you want to be with. And it's okay if the first person that you date doesn't end up being your spouse. That's, that's all right. In fact, I think we'd be in a better position if more people were quick to break up when they're dating instead of waiting until they're married and then quick to break up. And so their relationship ended, and when it did, it got ugly because two really good people, when they're dealing with heartache, can make some really bad and sometimes destructive choices that they otherwise wouldn't make. And they can do things to hurt themselves or to hurt other people that they would never in a million years otherwise do, but they don't really know how to cope with the feelings that they're feeling. And that's what happened in this case. It ended horribly. Now, I'm happy to report that both of them recovered, and both of them landed on their feet, and... and it's not as the same level of a disaster that it always was. And now they're both happily married to other people. And this is part, this is part, of, this is part of life and this is part of love. But part of love is this. Part of knowing who to love is knowing who not to. Part of knowing who to love is knowing who not to. Part of knowing what to love is knowing what not to. And that is what we're going to look at this morning as we continue looking at this letter that one of Jesus' best friends, a guy by the name of John, wrote to a group of people who made the decision to follow Jesus. And he's, he's set up, if, if you haven't joined us in the first couple parts of It's All About Love, he's set up this idea that God is light and in him there is no darkness. And he's also set up this idea that if we truly are people who follow Jesus, that our lives will, will reveal that. That our conduct, our conduct reveals our character. And now this morning, John is going to tell us how we can better follow Jesus. But he's going to tell us not just what to love, but he's going to tell us what not to love. And so if you have your Bible apps on your tablets or your phone, you can follow along there. And if not, it'll be on the screens as we look this morning, starting in 1 John 2. Verse 15, do not love the world or anything's in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, love isn't the vast majority of times instantaneous. 
love isn't the vast majority of times instantaneous. Some of the feelings that accompany love are instantaneous, falling in love. It happens quickly. It happens naturally. But it's not instantaneous. And a love that is lasting is, is a choice. You have to work your way to a feeling a lot of times. And if, if you haven't experienced that yet, you just haven't been married. Because as soon as you're married, what you understand, what you understand is, wow, the appeal of this wears off really quickly. Like, I used to like you a lot more than I do right now. If you're basing your relationship strictly on what you feel. And that can be a problem. What happens is for the relationship to grow and for it to develop and your love to deepen, you have to work your way toward a feeling. You have to serve somebody when the last thing you feel like doing is serving them. You have to be kind to somebody when the last thing you want to do is be kind to them. You have to elevate someone else's needs when you just want to focus on your own. But all these things are things that you can do to work your way to a feeling. But if you are just, just waiting on the feeling that you had when you first saw the person across the room to carry you through a lifetime together, it's not going to happen and it's not going to work. Love isn't instantaneous. Some of the feelings around it can be. But love is a process. And it grows and it deepens, and it changes. But it isn't an instant. And so there's this idea that we have here. When he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For most, the wrong priorities and choices is a gradual decline. Most people don't wake up one morning and say, today is the day I want to ruin my life. I mean, occasionally somebody might do that. But the vast majority of people don't wake up and say, today's it. I just feel like causing some chaos today. All right. Now, if you're a troublemaker, you probably do wake up with that a little bit. But you're not wanting just to, just to have your entire life burned down in front of you. Right? It's a gradual choice. Day in, day out. One glance leads to a text, which leads to another text, which leads to a picture that you have to delete for your parents or significant others see. It all started with a glance. One drink too many turns to two drinks too many turns to three drinks too many. And before, what was just something to help you relax has become something you're wholly dependent upon just to make it through the day. It's a gradual decline. It's a choice. So here we are with this idea that it is possible for people to just fall in love with what the world has to offer them. And why wouldn't it be? Because when you look at it, it looks so appealing, right? You see the successful. You see the toys that they have. The significant other that is just incredibly gorgeous to look at. The, the, stare, the, the portrayal that they put on social media, that their life is a dream and they don't have any real problems. And what happens is it sucks us in. That looks fun. And this is the problem with sin. Sin is fun. If it wasn't, we wouldn't do it. It's fun. And the problem is, it feels good at first. It's just a little lie. But I was able to spare their feelings by saying it. So I feel good about myself. I, why, would, why would I feel bad about that? It didn't hurt anybody. In fact, it maybe maintained peace in our relationship. I feel, I feel good about that. But it grows. It grows. 
And so this morning, what we have to do right now is we just have to look at ourselves and we have to ask the question, what do I love? What do I love? Can I look at my life and say, more than anything else, I have a deep desire to follow Jesus and I love him. Or if we inventory our lives and do the tough work of really looking at who we are as individuals into the areas of our lives that we keep hidden and tucked away from everyone else to see. We have to say, you know what? I love this more than Jesus. This is my pursuit. And if that's the case, then we have to ask ourselves some sobering questions about where we stand with God. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides for. Ever. We want what feels good, we want what looks good, and we want what makes us feel like we're in control. It's just our nature. We want what looks good, we want what feels good, and we want what makes us feel like we're in control. I want to stand before you today and let you all know that I have a problem. And it's called pizza. Pizza. I have never met a slice that I didn't at least like. I mean, there's levels, okay? There's like, like the worst pizza on the worst day from the worst pizza place. I'm still going to be like, yeah, I'd eat it again. I just would. It can be burned. It can be undercooked. It can be soft. It doesn't matter. I'm like, yeah, I'd do that again. I mean, 10 minutes later, I feel like death. I'm in the fetal position. I'm laying on the floor. I'm like, take me home, Jesus. Just call it. Let's go. I've lived a good life. An hour later, I'm like, I wonder if there's any leftovers over there. I could go for another slice. Yeah, it's really good. I have never met pizza that I don't like. It's, it's a problem. I'm, I'm going to freely admit that to you. It is an absolute problem. And here's the deal. Some of you have the spiritual gift of not liking pizza. Like that, I don't understand you, but I pray for your level of holiness one day, all right? I just do. And some of you can eat pizza in moderation. You are more spiritual than I am. Congratulations. But it looks so good. And even if it doesn't, it smells so good. And even if it doesn't, it tastes so good. But I just want more. And more. And more. And then what happens? 10, 20, 30 minutes later, an hour later, looking at Brooke and I'm like, we can't ever do this again. And then that feeling goes away. And that's when I go for the leftovers. And that's how some of us can approach life. It feels so good. It looks so good. It makes us feel like we're in control. And then we get hit with reality. We feel absolutely miserable. And then that feeling fades. And we're ready to repeat the cycle. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. And so John here is saying, listen, the end is near. 
the end is near, and in light of eternity, just understand this, the end is near, and none of us know when that time is coming, but God will ultimately redeem everything. God wins in the end, and in light of eternity, the end of this trouble, the end of this chaos that we see is near, so take heart, those of you who know Jesus. And he's just saying, there, there's, the Antichrist is coming, there have been many Antichrists, that's, that's anybody who's opposed Christ. Okay, anybody who's opposed Jesus have been lumped into this category. And then he says this, that there have been those, there have been those who, who once were with us. They were once part of us as a church. They were once part of us as a church, but, but they're not here anymore. They left. And now, the reason that they left is because their faith wasn't real. John here isn't talking about somebody who got mad at something and decided that they wanted to go to a different church. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about the person who, who decided that they were going to get upset about something and they're just through in the town. They're like, I'm going somewhere else. All right. And and listen, as, as a church, we, we don't want we don't want that to be true of anybody. All right. We are so thankful for each and every person who is here, who is part of Lakeside Community Church from the bottom of our heart. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. We are glad you're here. We love and we value you. We do. But there may come a time where you decide, yeah, you know what? This isn't for me. Or, yeah, I don't like this or I don't like that. And, and we, don't, we don't want anybody to leave. But ultimately, what we understand is not everybody is going to be passionate about the vision that we're passionate about. We're passionate about reaching people who are far from God. We're passionate about reaching, reaching future generations. We're passionate about the current generations. We are passionate about anybody who has a pulse. And so what we want to do is we want to reach people for Jesus without apology. That is what we are about here at Lakeside. But we want to position ourselves in the same way, that we're, that we're being effective with everyone and that we're reaching people. And if you're like, yeah, you know what? I don't want to reach people for Jesus. Listen, we love you, and, and please understand, please hear me. We love you and we value you, but if you're just going to be miserable here, don't be miserable. Come talk to us. But we're not going to freak out when somebody's like, yeah, I'm not passionate about that vision. I'm out. We love you and we hate to see you go. Hear my heart. We hate to see you go. We don't want you to. We want to work with you we want to, we, because we do love and value you. But it's not the end of the world to us because we understand that you love Jesus. And we don't want you to sit somewhere and be miserable. We understand that you love Jesus. And what he's talking about here is he's talking not about people who got upset about something and decided that they were going to just leave the church. He's talking about people who said that they love Jesus. And yet they're gone. And the reason that they're gone is because it was never genuine. It was never true. They left because their faith wasn't real. Not because they just went to another church. And then he builds this contrast for us, and he says this, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Some of you are reading the Bible in a Bible plan. In, in every December, you'll call a pastor or you'll call a friend and you'll get really excited about trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. And, and you can call me and I'd love to have the conversation with you, but here's the answer. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who the Antichrist is. But here is how you can know. Here's how you can know. That they will oppose the Father and Jesus. Here's the deal. Test everything you hear. Test everything you hear with Scripture. 
Because people will come, just as they were part of this church, people will come, and they will talk a good game. And it will sound incredible. But if it doesn't match up with what has been revealed to us in Scripture, then it's inaccurate. And sometimes people can be wrong about things that are benign. They're, they're not really that big a deal. They're wrong about something, and, and, and yeah, they're still wrong, but it's, it doesn't really impact anything. But other people can be wrong, and it can be incredibly damaging because at the core of what they're wrong about is who Jesus is and the relationship to God. We love you. We love all people, but understand this. Our message at Lakeside is an inclusive one and that we love and value everyone, but it's an exclusive one in this. There is but one way to God, and it's through Jesus. And you may not like that, but in all love, it doesn't really matter whether or not you like it. We don't get to determine that. God does. And we're going to love you enough to tell you that. This is why it is so important to be engaged and to be invested in reading Scripture. And so if, if you don't already have it on your phone or on your tablet, I'm, I'm just encouraging you, download the Bible app right now. Within that, there are literally thousands of plans that if, you're, if you don't engage with Scripture at all, you can start with something as simple as a verse of the day. Enable notifications on your device, and they will send you the verse. So literally, all you have to do to engage Scripture is look down at your phone and read a verse. It is that simple. And if you're not engaging at all, this is a great place for you to start. And so download it, enable your notifications, and get the verse of the day if you're not doing anything. And then after you're there for a while, and after you read the verse, and after you think about it for a little bit, then start to read a couple verses. Give yourself just five minutes. Just five minutes at some point in the day. And and if you don't have five minutes together, then split it up and just make it a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there. And just start engaging with a couple verses. And just see how your life will be different once you engage with Scripture. This is the way that God has chosen to communicate with us, His people. And if you're like, I don't do the technological thing then get a Bible. And if you already have a Bible, then just start engaging with it for a couple minutes a day. And if you don't have one and you don't do the technological thing, we'll get you one. And if, but if you have the technological thing, just download the Bible app. It's going to be easier and quicker than us giving it to you. You'll have it right now. It'll be instantaneous. But wherever you are, make sure that you are engaging with Scripture. Why? Because we are inundated with messages. We are inundated with opinions. And it seems that in our society, if you, if you shout the loudest, then your opinion carries more weight. Make sure that with all the messages you're hearing, you are leaving room to hear from God. Because you are going to be inundated with lies and with false messages. There was a recent psychological study, and somebody said the average individual hears over 600 lies a day. Over 600 lies a day. And I'm pretty sure this study was done before all the political advertising was going on. So we've, I mean, we've got to be at least 6,000 right now. <laughs> this, I, it's incredible when you think about it. And then when you're like, wow, that's so many lies. And then you're like, oh, I wonder if I'm part of that. I wonder the little subtle things that I've embellished. I wonder the little things that I don't even think twice about. And I'm like, I'm not really sure that that's true. So in in a culture, in a society where we're inundated with lies, make sure that you're embracing the truth. Make sure that you're engaged with the truth. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. 
If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Engage the truth. Engage the truth. I cannot stress enough how important it is for those of us who want to follow Jesus to be engaging with God in what he's revealed to us. Engage the truth. The only way that we can let something abide in us, the only way that we can let something grow in us, is if we're engaged with it. And so it starts just just with the simple step of just starting to make sure that it's something that we do, and it's something that we're consuming. And then after we consume it, we allow it to go to work in our lives. We consume it, and then we abide in it by allowing it to grow, allowing it to change our thoughts, allowing it to change then after it's changed our thoughts, our behavior. But we must be engaged with the heart of God. And this is the promise that he's given to us. Eternal life. This is the hope that we have. I had to go back to Ohio this week to be a part of a funeral of of my my wife's grandmother. She had asked that I would be part of her funeral service. And so we traveled back to Ohio and uh, was there for for the funeral and and got got to play a role in that. And I looked around the room, and her grandmother was someone who had the hope of Jesus. And so we grieve that that she's gone. We grieve that she's passed away. And yet we grieve with hope because she's no longer suffering when she's with God. But as I looked around the room, the contrast that I saw between those that I know because they're family, between those that I know have a relationship with Jesus and understood this dynamic, and those who've made the choice for whatever reason not to have the relationship with Jesus, the contrast couldn't be clearer. And what was the difference? This is the message of love. This is, this is our message. That we have hope, not because of the things that we have done, because we have nothing to offer God, but our message of, of love is, is that God loved us so much that when we had nothing to offer Him, and when we were without hope, God reached down and provided us a means to have a relationship with Him. When we were hopeless, He provided us with hope. There are many who don't understand this message. And so all the more reason that we need to cling to that, which the world around us does not understand, but is available to those of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. There are those who are trying to deceive. Don't let them be successful. Abide in God. When I was a kid, we went to the sand dunes in North Carolina. And we're, we're located here. You have, plenty of, you have plenty of wind that you can fly kites. Where I grew up in Ohio, we didn't have as much wind. And so every, on a real windy day, you'd see a couple people go to a park, and, and they would fly a kite there. But it really wasn't that common. And so when we went to the sand dunes in North Carolina, you just see all of the kites, and there was plenty of wind. And, and my sister and I, we were, we were young, and we were like, we want to go fly kites. 
And so our parents took us to a kite shop. And they let us pick out kites. And it was a lot more impressive than this kite. This kite was from the Dollar Tree. It was a dollar. Like, something happens to that, bye bye Right? Oh, no. This was my first kite. And it was, it was a nice kite. And I got to the sand dunes, and my dad helped me get my kite up. And it was, it was flying, and the wind was vicious, and it was just whipping around. And then he went over to help my sister get her kite up, along with my mom. And he left me alone. And something happened, and I don't know what happened. I was just a little kid. I'm sure I screwed it up somehow. I mean, it happens. That's what I do with things. I mess them up. I'm all right with that. But somehow the handle was coming loose. And I didn't want to let my kite go. And so I grabbed onto the rope as the kite was in the air. And I held on for dear life with all my might. In my hand, I can still feel it. It was on fire. And it hurt. I didn't want to lose that kite. And I started crying. And in, in the tears, my dad came running over to discover what had happened. And he couldn't believe that I'd held on to the kite. I valued that kite. And I didn't want to let it go. And I held on to that rope with all my might. The winds of this world will beat you up. There will be people who say things about you that are not true. There will be things that you want that for whatever reason you do not have. There will be times that you question your priorities. There will be times that you think, oh, this looks so appealing. If I just, the winds of this world will beat you up. So I'm just begging with you. Hold on. With all your might. To the truth that God has revealed to us. To the love that God has made available to us. To the hope that we have. There will be those who ridicule you. There will be those who mock you. There will be those who say you're crazy. There will be those who don't get it. There will be times that you think it would be so much easier if I would just let go. You abide. You hold on to the truth with all your might. And never let go. And now, little children, abide in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Your conduct reveals your character. Your conduct reveals your character. I want to leave you with this. So much of our lives, we focus on enhancing our competency. We try to acquire new skills. We try to become better at certain things. A lot of our jobs are, are built around this, that we're acquiring new skills, we're trying to better ourselves professionally. So much of our lives we spend building around enhancing our competency. But I want to challenge you as followers of Jesus. Let's make sure that as much as we're trying to enhance our competency, we're enhancing our character. 
that we're not just working on new skills, but we're making sure that we're working on ourselves. That we're making sure that our conduct lines up with that which we say, because our conduct reveals our character. And if you want your conduct to line up with what you say, and if you want better character, the best way to work on your character and not just your competency is to engage with the heart of God. And it's been revealed to us. In scripture. And so Lakeside, let's cling to that hope. Let's cling to that truth. And let's make sure that our conduct points to the transformation that God is doing within us. God, I pray that you'd help us. Help us not love the world. Help us abide in you. Help us cling to you, to the truth. God, I pray that you, in the quietness of this moment, help us all look within. In our hearts and in our lives. Help us see what's there that needs to go. Give us the strength to tell it goodbye. And help us become more like you. For your glory. God, may we make engaging with you through Scripture a priority. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.